It's 911 emergency. I need mean, anyone to find you. I'm still fighting now. It's just blood. It's just blood. I need all five units to the sugar refinery now. Breaking news tonight, a developing story at this hour, 7.30 this evening. The worst of all possible fears in a community, an explosion and an awful fire at the sugar refinery. My husband is in there watching TV, and he was flipping through the channels, and he said, the sugar refinery just blew up. I said, holy cow, I, I got to go. And I just knew that there was going to be a lot of people there because the change of shifts for everybody. So I knew at least there would be a minimum of 60 people. And just got my truck and went. I got a victim coming out of front, multiple victims. And then my cell phone rang, and it was uh, the police chief, Burko, who said, I am at the scene. Here is what I see. People are severely burned. This is not a drill. Um, we need to go into action now. And shortly after that, I received a phone call from the chief nursing officer to alert me, and I was already on my way to the hospital. And I started activating the telephone tree, calling my nurse managers, telling them to come in. But most of them already were on their way. I was at home, about to read my four-year-old a bedtime story, and the phone rang. And my husband said it was Karen Watts, our chief nursing officer. Her words to me was, Maggie, this is the real deal. I flipped on the radio and heard the radio traffic and, and knew that we were in for a long night. I had just sat down to start eating supper when I got my phone call. It was pretty scary. You know, we tried to, I told them to start making phone calls and let's start getting everybody mobilized and start bringing in the crew. I was at home, uh, actually getting my four-year-old daughter out of the bathtub when my phone rang and said that we had a major incident and that they needed all this lieutenants and field supervisors come in and we had a MCI mass casualty incident. So I came down to the emergency department and freaked out. <laughs> Tried to figure out, you know, what my team's got to do, where we got to go, who can I get to come in. I didn't have to call anybody before I noticed there were about 30 people here to help me out. We got ourselves ready to go and it wasn't but just a couple minutes they went ahead and dispatched us to the scene. Go ahead, 11. I got a call about 10 minutes after the explosion and uh, from our communications center and they told us that we possibly had an explosion at the sugar refinery and that there may be as many as 150 people involved. Having worked at the hospital earlier that day, I knew there was an ambulance available. So I went by the hospital and picked up that ambulance and another team member and we went directly to the scene of the explosion. So this was going to be the biggest disaster that I had ever taken part in. Something we've, you know, talked about. We certainly practice for these kind of issues, but it was a very scary thought. We all know a lot of people who work at the refinery. The third trauma surgeon then arrived was Dr. Frank Davis, who, was, who then decided to go out to the scene of the site, because that front end uh, Im impact can tell you, do we have 50, do we have 100, do we have a thousand patients. When I first arrived, there were probably 25 or 30 uh, gurneys out under the ambulance uh, bay. There were probably eight or nine ambulances that had backed in that were unloading uh, ambulances. Uh, patients, uh, most of the ones I saw were clearly severely burned. These people that came out walking with some of the most severe burns that I've ever seen. So, you know, immediately we were thinking about that these are definitely life-threatening injuries and, you know, they've got to be treated immediately. LifeStar responded directly to the scene and they transported patients to Memorial. We landed behind the uh, elementary school gym and that was our staging area and we transported the people initially to Memorial to the trauma center that EMS brought to us by ambulance. When the patients actually rolled off of the ambulance, um, the gurney, then I was essentially the first one to see them and decide where they should be placed. As the first ambulances rolled in, we kept trying to keep track of what kind of bed availability there was in the emergency room so that these victims would have somewhere to go. I got here about five minutes before the first patient and the first four or five patients all arrived at the same time. I expected more mass chaos, but it was actually very organized. We got everyone into a room, um, got them taken care of. What was remarkable is that our medical director who was in charge, um, Dr. James Ramage, he was so calm and that really influenced the whole team. And, you know, he delegated and assigned responsibilities. Everybody was in their rooms working. About four or five patients would arrive simultaneously and it came, it, it seemed in waves and thinking about it, I, I guess according to the blast injury, we didn't know if anyone had actually died at the scene at that point, but we could tell from the first wave we had very severely injured patients. Go inside. Go inside. Go inside. Go inside. Go inside. 
West side of the building, guys. West side, West side. of the building. I mean, we saw people from 25% total body surface area burns all the way up to 80, 85, 90%. Burn patients certainly require a lot of care. They can't regulate their body temperatures from, from the burn injuries. Um, you have to worry about their airway, particularly with a blast as well. They can have internal airway burns. The staff here all pulled together. It did not matter where you worked, what area was your expertise. Everyone pulled together and did exactly what was needed to be done. There were folks lined up on the walls asking, what can I do to help? What can I do to help? You had neonatal nurses that showed up. You had peds nurses. You had people from uh, human resources. We had um, a registrar who, um, down in the ER, they were taking someone out to the helicopter to fly them to Augusta, and she, uh, they needed somebody to carry an oxygen tank. And so she just picked it up and went with them to the helipad and carried the oxygen tank. Everyone was very calm. Uh, volunteers had come in, people had stayed over from an earlier shift. Uh, other employees had come in from home. Uh, but we immediately set about organizing what we were going to do. We are good in a crisis. We have great people. You know, this building is, is just technology without the people, and our people are superior. They are not only great in a crisis, but they're great in everyday work, and they pulled together and said, what do we need to do? We'll do it. There was uh, at least, you know, three or four residents in each room every time a new patient came through the door. and. We were either intubating the patients, putting large bore IVs into the patients, getting IV fluids, putting ultrasounds on the patients' bellies to make sure that they weren't bleeding internally. Um, I actually described it to Dr. McGuire as an orchestra, um, just performing in sync, because that's exactly what it looked like. There were 60, that was the number he had, 60 people that they were still trying to account for at this time. Media, of course, is wanting to know what's happening, and they're staying in their place, but they're saying, we need some information. So that was all going through there, finding the right person, which fortunately I did with, with Dr. Goldstein to get out there and, and talk to the folks. Did you call people in, if so, how many? Yeah, we, I mean, this is something that we pretty much practice on a routine basis being a level one trauma center, so we have a, a, a protocol for this kind of response. From a family standpoint, I knew that we would have a lot of families and relatives that would show up at the hospital. We were looking at a way to manage those families, and my director of service took the families over to the Hoskins Center, which is a conference area and auditorium that we have, so that we could gather them together, um, try to keep them calm, try to give them as much information as we could. Once I knew we had all of the patients that we were going to receive, my focus then turned to, we want these families to see these patients as quickly as possible. Seeing our team members kneeling with folks, with talking to them one-on-one, -on -one, with holding their hands or with hugging them, with crying with them, giving them assurance that they were in the right place, those kinds of things. It was, I described it to someone, it looked like a blanket of compassion was spread over that huge room. What I did personally with families is to go to each one and, you know, just kind of stoop where they were sitting and start to talk with them, communicate on a one-to-one -one basis and get a sense of who this person is and what this person means to them. And then assure them that we will give them all the information that we have as we acquire it from, from hour to hour. I saw that night more compassion and love in a facility that's always had it and I knew that it was there, I just saw it come to a more of a superior form than I ever had. We have a close relationship with the uh, medical center up in Augusta, the burn center up in Augusta, and burns is such a specialty care because it's more of a long-term care than more of an acute care. But working very closely with the burn center, it was, um, it was nice to have that effect, to have that contact. It was definitely a, t a feeling of accomplishment that we were able to uh, stabilize the patients and, and get them out of here to a uh, to a place that really specializes in that where we knew they get very good care. I was at an anesthesia meeting here at the hospital and I received a call from uh, Dr. Mullins stating uh, that there had been an explosion in Savannah and that he was planning on uh, flying down there and asked if I would join him. We pulled up at the emergency room entrance. There were stretchers lined up and people lined up ready to go. It was pretty impressive to see the team that was assimilated down there and how they were working. One thing I was immediately impressed with was the coordination of the staff uh, from housekeeping to nursing to the residents. Uh, I think medical students were there as well and, and the attendings. 
uh, all levels, there was uh, such coordination that it made things flow very easily. Had they not had the system set up, they had set up in Savannah, a lot of these patients wouldn't made it to the burn center. It had happened in another part of Georgia, uh, without a trauma system, without a trauma center, we probably wouldn't have the number of, of patients we have alive today. Lives were saved that night because many of these people were injured so severely that they would not have survived the first few hours after that injury if they had not had rapid, effective care. And there's no question that the response of the team, the number of people who were here and available to care for them, and the expertise that, that was available was life-saving. I love this job. I've always wanted this job, and that is what I was put here for, is to take care of those patients that we encountered that night. And it just made me appreciate and love this job that much more. You do it because at the end of the day, you go home thinking that you gave somebody a better chance of life. And um, I can honestly say that these patients, when I left, I knew we had given them every chance that they could have to be able to live through this. The teamwork and the camaraderie, um, it was truly unbelievable. I don't know if I could have, in my best case scenario, predicted that it would have gone as well as it did. Um, and I have no doubt in my mind that you know several patients um, are alive because of the way that everyone responded. It was, it was difficult. It was something I wasn't sure that I was capable of doing, but I did it and I can do it again. Don't want to do it again, but I can do it again. These caregivers, they go into this field because they want to save lives. And uh, we're proud that we had the opportunity to do that. And we're proud of what we have given back. And uh, I think that, that was, that's important for us. It was an important moment for Memorial.